called on to speak in public will be familiar with the problem of aboutness, the difficulty of defining exactly what something is about. My novel, The Last King of Scotland, is about Idi Amin, yes, and the Doctor, yes. But it did not give over the full facts about Amin's regime, certainly not to the extent of being a question on a TV general knowledge show, as I heard recently, who was Idi Amin's doctor, not the fictional character of my novel, that's for sure. Uh, <clears throat> or of certain of Amin's pronouncements uh, in the novel, getting into Wikipedia as if they were fact. These are problems that historians still have to sort out. In some ways, it's easier to talk about what something isn't about. And The Last King of Scotland wasn't really about the Asian experience under Armin. Sure, there is one page of fairly encyclopedic reference to what happened, and another half page of dramatic business involving an Asian doctor's assistant who is smuggled over the border to Rwanda, actually quite an unusual escape route, but otherwise very little. So looking back, insofar as an historical novel has duties to history, the fact that I didn't really deal with the Asian exodus came to, came to me to seem one of the many failures of that book. Though, of course, selection from history is one of the jobs of the historical novelist. But it is certain that the exile of Asians from Uganda was a very big part of the larger story. Oddly, that story of the exodus became a bigger part of the film of the book, with some scenes that I didn't write and which, to some extent, seemed to me a bit improbable, be that as it may. But then I got a chance, <clears throat> about ten years after the book came out, to set the score right. I was at a wedding in Hampstead of the son of the prominent Kenyan lawyer, Fitz D'Souza, whom some of you may know, when I was approached by another D'Souza, John D'Souza, no relation, whom other of you may know. John works for the Madvani family. Would I, he asked, be interested in helping Manabai Madvani finish his memoirs? Well, we got talking there and afterwards, and before I knew it, I started interviewing Manabai and visiting the family's sugar plantation in Jinja. It was the beginning of a long and fascinating journey that eventually led to the publication by Random House India of a book called Tide of Fortune. It chronicled the story of the Madvani family, the building up of the family business from the 1890s onwards, their expulsion from Uganda, their renaissance there and elsewhere. I remember about those early beginnings, one of Manabai's, uh, one of the points that he was very uh, keen to make was that uh, Asians didn't just come to East Africa to build the Uganda Railway. He was very insistent about this and said, uh, <coughs> well implied, because he would never say such a thing completely directly, that in many ways this seems like a, 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 the British historian's uh, way of putting down Asians, that they were always in a labouring class, and that, that was, or came out of a labouring class, and that wasn't the case at all. And, and, and historians are now starting to uncover the long, much more ancient history of, of uh, uh, connection between the East African seaboard and India. Madabai's own long, interesting and eventful life sadly ended last year, and I shall miss his quiet wisdom. I learned a lot talking to him. I'm very glad that his son, Kamlesh, is able to join us on the panel today. The whole process of writing that book was fascinating, and I had the honour of seeing how a large Gujarati family operates from the inside. Now, Manabai, as some of you will know, was locked up by Armin for a period during the ex exile crisis in a cell at Nakindi military prison. That experience which involved listening to the hammer blows of execution outside, had a very powerful effect on him. I think it made him consider the very nature of identity, and that perhaps he went into that cell as a Gujarati Lahana and came out a citizen of the world, ready for the challenges of diaspora and exile that were to come. There were many, many stories in that exile, and I hope we'll hear some of them today. I don't think historians have even begun to uncover the complexity of it all. I think his time in, in that cell also prepared Manabai for the challenges of return 
the family went back to Uganda and restarted their business there. And the challenges of being part of a large extended family, some of whom may not want to be part of a business or be commercially minded in the least. A lot of all this involved a delicate balance between tradition and modernity, between principle and flexibility. But if I could identify one Madhvani family maxim that I think Manavai clung to after those terrible days in McKinney, it was that all obstacles can be overcome through determination. Another maxim was that you must be crystal clear about your objectives. I think both of these thoughts, or something like them, are common to a lot of the success that East African Asians have experienced in the past 40 years, from the great conglomerates we've seen grow to all areas of life. We hear a lot about resilience these days, but in the Madhvani story and that of many, many other East African Asians, I think we see real examples of resilience. East African Asians are tough, they persist, bounce back, never give up. That is part of their success. I don't think, though, that we should just think of success as the only paradigm in which to view East African Asians. And perhaps we might think about some of the areas in which there hasn't been success too today. I think that's probably quite important to do that. But by and large, it has been a story of success. Success not just in business, but in government here in the UK and elsewhere, in law enforcement, Tariq is here, um, in education, medicine and the law, and in the arts and journalism. I'm very glad that Yasmin Alibi Brown is also here with, with us today, who is one of the forerunners in that area, speaking out when many others were silent. As she and others prove, the glittering success of the East African Asian diaspora has not just been a male phenomenon. Britain has been very lucky to have been the place where some of this success has taken place. And if I can speak with my British rather than African hat on, and actually I'm only half British, mostly Irish, as my wife puts it somewhat assiduously. Uh, I think we gave you a rather curmudgeonly welcome when you arrived. Thank you for repaying that without rancour, with such good grace, showing this country, as it has been shown so many times before and since, that its own identity is not a formless and empty notion of Englishness but something that gains its value from outside, in the same way that the kernel of a nut is nothing without the layers of resilient shell which surround it. Thank you.